You are listening to Motor Torpedo Boat, Escape from Hong Kong, 1941, written and narrated by Mark Felton. Episode 1 Sleek grey motor torpedo boats sat gently bobbing against a wooden jetty, their superstructures draped with camouflage netting and recently cut foliage in an attempt to make them appear to be just an extension of the jungle-covered island to which they were moored. The effect had worked, for although Japanese aircraft had occasionally buzzed overhead, no bombs had fallen. The crews worked feverishly to load the MTBs with stores, fuel and weapons for the coming journey, while ashore officers listened to the sounds of heavy fighting in the far distance, the crump of artillery and mortars mixed with the crackle of machine guns and rifles. Columns of smoke rose on the horizon from the direction of Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. How much longer was the most common comment that passed between officers and men, as well as, will they make it? The MTBs were hidden for one specific reason, to make possible the escape from doomed Hong Kong of a very special group of Allied officers, who must under no circumstances fall into the hands of the Japanese. So wait the crews must, biting their fingernails and constantly scanning the surrounding water and islands with binoculars for some sign of the promised passengers. The task of defending the indefensible British colony of Hong Kong had been given to the army in 1940. The garrison troops were drawn from Britain, Canada and India, supported by local Chinese and European volunteer forces. The Royal Air Force had practically ceased to exist as a presence in China, having only three elderly Vickers Wildebeest torpedo bombers and a pair of Supermarine Walrus maritime patrol aircraft stationed at RAF Kai Tak in Hong Kong. The Japanese destroyed both seaplanes and two of the torpedo boats on the first day of the battle on the 8th of December 1941 and also destroyed or damaged most of the civilian aircraft being employed by the air section of the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps. Major General Christopher Maltby, the British commander, tried to slow the Japanese assault by falling back onto prepared defensive positions in the new territories, particularly a line of redoubts and trench systems called the Gin Drinkers Line. But Maltby's 10,000 Commonwealth and Empire troops were heavily outnumbered by the combat-experienced 50,000 Japanese, and many, including the Canadians, had only recently arrived in the colony and lacked any combat experience. The British did not expect to be able to prevent the Japanese from taking Hong Kong, and instead Maltby had been ordered by Winston Churchill to delay the inevitable for as long as possible fighting a protracted battle from the mainland onto the island itself before surrendering. British resistance in indefensible Hong Kong was vital to buy more time for the defence of the Malayan Peninsula and the strategic naval base at Singapore. But Maltby's attempts to follow a Maginot Line strategy was doomed to failure. Major General Maltby's only hope of holding the Japanese in Hong Kong was to inflict upon them a delaying action, centred on the Shingman Redoubt, the Gin Drinkers Line main defensive position. But Maltby could only spare a single platoon to defend the redoubt against several Japanese regiments, and it was easily captured on the 10th of December, forcing the British to abandon the entire length of their static fortifications in the new territories. Maltby had hoped that the Gin Drinkers Line would have held the Japanese for at least two weeks. On the 11th of December, the Japanese began advancing into the city of Kowloon, with the British mainland brigade retreating quickly through the town under heavy artillery and aerial attack towards the ferry terminals to Hong Kong Island. Although the 7th Rajput Regiment bravely formed a rearguard that enabled most of the British and Indian troops to cross over to Hong Kong Island, the Japanese rapidly captured the town and the Royal Navy base. One of the final actions before the Japanese overran the naval base on the 12th of December was the scuttling of the headquarters vessel, the 3,650-ton HMS Tamar. The venerable wooden vessel built in 1863 had served as China Station headquarters since 1897. That same day as the Tamar was being blown apart, 
HMS Moff, an insect-class gunboat, was also lost when her dry dock was deliberately flooded. The twelve vessels of the insect class had been constructed during the First World War for service against the Austro-Hungarian Danube flotilla. Ironically, the class were ordered as China gunboats to conceal their true destination, but eleven of them did eventually end up patrolling the rivers of China. Before being sunk in Hong Kong, Moth had patrolled the Yangtze River for many years, a powerful presence, as the vessel was twice the size at 645 tons of the other classes of British gunboats, and well armed. The Japanese later salvaged the Moth in July 1942, and she was commissioned as the Suma and sent back to patrolling the Yangtze. On the 19th of March 1945, she struck an American mine near Nanjing and sank. The other insect-class gunboat present in Hong Kong during the battle, HMS Sakala, was in the thick of the action from the outset and under repeated dive-bomber attack. The vessel's two 6-inch and two 12-pounder guns were backed up by a 3-inch anti-aircraft gun and six Lewis machine guns, and by violent manoeuvring and a near-constant flak barrage, the gunboat avoided serious damage until near the end of the battle. In the meantime, what remained of the Royal Navy was ordered to vacate Hong Kong and make for the safety of the Singapore naval base. The Royal Navy's presence in Hong Kong had been steadily run down since the outbreak of war in Europe. The major vessels of the 5th Cruiser Squadron had all departed by the end of 1940 to where they would be usefully employed fighting the Germans, followed by the nine boats of the 4th Submarine Flotilla. When the order to evacuate Hong Kong was received following the Japanese invasion, two of the three destroyers stationed there left as quickly as possible. Only the Admiralty S-Class destroyer HMS Thracian remained as Japanese air activity over the naval base and Victoria went unchecked by any fears of British fighter interdiction. This lone destroyer was now the Navy's largest vessel in China, and the remaining ships in Hong Kong harbour were either too small or too insignificant to be evacuated. There were six gunboats of assorted classes and sizes, nine auxiliary minesweepers and nine local defence craft, as well as the auxiliary patrol vessels HMS Kai Ming and Swanley. On the 13th of December, one of the small force of gunboats managed to score a victory for the British defence. HMS Tern, a 262-ton vessel built in England in 1927, downed a Japanese aircraft with her two 3-inch guns, one of the few successes recorded by the Royal Navy during the battle. The Japanese now settled into preparing for an amphibious assault across Victoria Harbour, and they extensively shelled and bombed the island's north shore to soften up its defences. Grounding on Lama Island on the 15th of December damaged HMS Thracian as she avoided repeated Japanese aerial attacks. The Thracian skipper, Lieutenant Commander A. L. Pears, decided on a drastic course of action. On the following night, the badly damaged destroyer was deliberately run aground on Round Island in Repulse Bay in an effort to scuttle her. However, the attempt failed. The Japanese later captured the destroyer. Turned over to the Imperial Japanese Navy in November 1942, after extensive repairs, the Thracian was commissioned as Patrol Vessel 101, and was then made a training ship in 1944. She ended the war in Yokosuka, Japan, attached to the Torpedo School before being captured by the Americans. Hauled back to Hong Kong, the destroyer was broken up shortly after the war. There remained only one unit that could still pack a considerable offensive punch, and that had been ordered to remain in Hong Kong because the small size of its vessels meant they could be effectively hidden around the colony, and their speed and firepower would prove very effective to disrupting a Japanese amphibious assault on Hong Kong from captured Kowloon. This was the second motor torpedo boat, or MTB flotilla, formed in 1938 to bolster British defences in the colony. In May 1941, Lieutenant Commander Gerard Gandy, who was a descendant of Admiral Lord Nelson, took over command of the vessels. 
part-time seamen from the Hong Kong Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve replaced most of the flotilla's professional Royal Navy officers, who returned to the shooting war in Europe. The flotilla was equipped with the British powerboat 60-foot MTB, designed in 1936. They had a top speed of 33 knots and were armed with two 18-inch torpedoes and five Lewis machine guns. After the departure of most Royal Navy Blue Water assets in 1940, the MTBs remained the only real offensive vessels left to the British in China. On the 13th of December, MTBs 7 and 9 had performed sterling service, evacuating troops of the 5th 7th Rajputs from North Lyman to the destroyer HMS Thracian waiting offshore, after the Indian battalion had formed part of the garrison's rearguard at Kowloon. The two MTBs had taken off 260 men from the devastated battalion, which had lost all of its British officers during the retreat from the Gin Drinkers Line. On the 18th of December, MTB-8 blew up on her slip at Aberdeen Island after a bomb splinter hit her during the incessant Japanese air attacks. Three days later, the remaining boats of 2nd MTB flotilla went into action as Japanese troops were being ferried across Victoria Harbour from Kowloon to Hong Kong Island in a daring amphibious assault. MTB-7 under the command of acting petty officer Buddy Hyde, came under intense machine gun, mortar and artillery fire of North Point. But Hyde pressed home his attack with great courage and determination, managing to sink several Japanese landing craft. The MTB's Lewis guns raked the Japanese vessels from end to end, and the backwash from the big engines overturned several, leaving enemy soldiers thrashing around in the water. Hyde also dropped a few depth charges as MTB-7 powered through the Japanese flotilla like a lion through a herd of wildebeest. MTB-9 entered Kowloon Harbour, tearing through the remnants of the landing craft Hyde had already destroyed, peppering swimming Japanese with machine gun fire, but hotly pursued by Japanese aircraft who were determined to sink her. Leading stoker Reg Barker was mortally wounded, and MTB-9's starboard engine was knocked out by aerial cannon fire. MTB-7 was raked by Japanese automatic fire, killing two of her crew. Both boats tried to extricate themselves at reduced speed, MTB-9 managing to hit two Japanese aircraft with its Lewis guns. It had been a valiant effort against superior odds, and the MTB attacks undoubtedly caused some loss and disrupted the Japanese landings. A second pair of boats, MTBs 11 and 12, roared into Kowloon Harbour to finish off any remaining landing craft, but 12 took a direct hit and smashed at full speed into the harbour wall. Only three of her crews survived the impact. MTB 11 made it back, and orders were given to stand the rest of the flotilla down. Unfortunately, MTB-26 missed this order and was last seen sitting motionless in the harbour with a single Lewis gun firing madly. The operation to disrupt the Japanese landings had cost the lives of 20 British sailors and the loss of two irreplaceable motor torpedo boats. Only five boats remained seaworthy. Although a brave gesture, the MTB attacks could not prevent the Japanese from landing in force on the north shore of Hong Kong Island. Three Japanese regiments came ashore on the 18th of December, and the final battle for Hong Kong commenced as General Maltby threw his remaining two brigades of infantry against the invaders. On the 19th of December, fierce fighting raged throughout the island, but the Japanese successfully cut the British defences in two, and although the British forces bravely attempted to re-establish a defensive line, the Japanese were too numerous and too strong. The gunboat, HMS Turn, was scuttled in Deepwater Bay, possibly as a result of a mistaken signal. On the 21st of December, the gunboat Sakala, having stood off an amazing 60 Japanese dive-bomber attacks during the course of the battle, finally succumbed to the inevitable and was destroyed. Struck by three bombs in the West Lama Channel, close to Hong Kong Island, she was probably also scuttled. The British lost control of the island's vital water reservoirs as the fighting progressed through the Wong Nai Chong Gap, 
and 18 days after the initial Japanese attack across the Shamchun River on the border, Maltby prepared reluctantly to surrender. The last of the gunboats was also scuttled on the 25th of December. HMS Robin, built in 1934 and one of the final gunboats dispatched to Chinese waters, disappeared beneath the waves to prevent her capture by the victorious Japanese. With the surrender of the colony inevitable, the Commodore, Hong Kong, commanding all remaining naval assets, ordered all Royal Navy vessels, except the MTBs and their tenders, to scuttle themselves. The decision had been taken, per a pre-war agreement, that the remaining MTBs were to be used to evacuate the 46-year-old, one-armed and one-legged, Vice Admiral Chan Chak and his small Chinese Nationalist Navy liaison party from Hong Kong to prevent their capture by the Japanese. Admiral Chan had been in Hong Kong since 1938, assisting the Hong Kong police and army intelligence. His cover was as a stockbroker for Wa Ki and company in the Shell Building on Queen's Road. A small Chinese team assisted Chan. 37-year-old Colonel Yi Shui Ki of the Chinese Secret Service posed as an insurance salesman from Shanghai. 29-year-old Lieutenant Commander Henry Hong Xu was Chan's flag commander, and 45-year-old Coxon Yuan Chuen, a martial arts expert, acted as Chan's bodyguard. Admiral Chan was the Kuomintang leader for the entire region, the Kuomintang being the Chinese Nationalist Party that ruled Free China, and he had extensive contacts with Chinese guerrillas operating behind Japanese lines, making him doubly useful to the British now that defeat appeared a foregone conclusion. The old Chinese criminal organizations collectively called the Triads worked for the Japanese during the invasion of the New Territories and Kowloon. The Japanese Kempei Tai military police paid them handsomely for their cooperation, and because of triad sabotage activities, the Imperial Army was able to overcome General Maltby's defences in only four days. Admiral Chan decided that he must prevent the same thing from occurring on Hong Kong Island. He decided to raise money from among the British and Chinese communities to outpay the Japanese and gain the services of the triads. This ploy worked, as the triads were basically opportunists who would work for anyone willing to pay well. The triads and the British Special Operations Executive, or SOE team, worked together to eliminate the dangerous Japanese fifth column that was threatening the rear areas in Hong Kong before the Japanese crossed the harbour. Those suspected fifth columnists were rounded up and summarily shot by Punjabi troops. SOE's Z Force had been kept very busy in the run up to the Japanese invasion of Hong Kong Island. On the 15th of December 1941, Mike Kendall, along with Major Colin McEwen and Monia or John Talan, placed limpet mines on a ship that was occupied by a Japanese observation post off North Point. McEwen was a former Edinburgh University rugby blue and Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps officer while Talan was a white Russian émigré who had been working in Hong Kong when the war broke out. On the 18th of December, the SOE team in Aberdeen Dockyard appropriated the 60-foot-long motor launch ML French. It had been used to run supplies to the Chinese fighting the Japanese up the coast. Similar in size and configuration to a British MTB, the French was fast and fairly quiet. On the 20th of December, orders were received by the 2nd MTB flotilla to break out to mainland China and in the event of not reaching Allied lines, to act as a guerrilla force until relieved by an allegedly advancing Chinese nationalist army. The next day, the three-man SOE team arrived and loaded MTB-10 with Bren guns, explosives, food and clothing. Coming along for the ride were four officers from General Maltby's Battle Box headquarters. They had asked for permission to attempt a breakout instead of surrendering, and Maltby had freely given them leave to do so. Two of the officers would have been extremely valuable to the Kempe Tai, and it was imperative that they were not captured. Major Arthur Goring, the 11th, King Edward's own Lancers, Probin's horse, and RAF squadron leader Maxwell Oxford, both took away with them certain confidential files. 
Police Superintendent William Robinson of the Indian Intelligence Bureau had originally been sent with Major Goring to Hong Kong to hunt potential mutineers and fifth colonists among Sikh troops stationed in the colony. They were interested in getting China's number two, Admiral Chan Chak, some of his staff and some higher British officers away from the island and decided to combine the two parties, wrote Lieutenant Ron Ashby, an MTB commander. Three or four days before the end, we were under official orders to get away at the last moment at all costs after picking up the official party. The remaining seaworthy MTBs were loaded with iron rations, rifles, stores and equipment. Kendall and his team also had time to brief the Matelos on behind-the-line survival techniques. In order to preserve the vessels ready for the escape, the boats were hidden out of harm's way. MTBs 7 and 9 were tied up along a pier in Telegraph Bay between Mount Davis and Aberdeen, the crews carefully camouflaging the vessels against Japanese aircraft with straw, canvas and tree branches, as well as camouflage netting. MTBs 10, 11 and 27 were hidden at the southwest tip of Up Lei Chan, covering the exit to Aberdeen Harbour. On the 25th of December, the crews managed a reasonable Christmas dinner with a double ration of rum for each man. A ceasefire was called by the Japanese at 9am and lasted until noon as delegates from both sides discussed a British surrender. However, at noon, the Japanese bombardment resumed. At 3pm, General Maltby advised the governor, Sir Mark Young, that further useful military resistance was no longer possible. The British had been pushed back into the Stanley Peninsula. At 3.15pm, Young informed the Japanese that the British would surrender, the final ceremony being conducted at the Peninsula Hotel in Kowloon at 6pm that evening. The Chinese dubbed the 25th of December 1941 Black Christmas with good reason. Tune in next time to find out if the five MTBs and their precious cargoes can escape from Hong Kong after the British surrender and make it to freedom in mainland China. You have been listening to episode one of Motor Torpedo Boat, Escape from Hong Kong 1941, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history videos, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. 